Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a um, few works from actually my, my PhD and uh, particularly I'm going to talk about uh, semantic manipulation of uh, visual content. Um, so let's start. Um, just just to give you sort of an intuition, let's let's imagine that uh, uh, you, you have this, uh, you, you see this image of a car and uh, you want to uh, describe it to, to a friend of yours. So uh, they, there are different aspects of the image that uh, you could describe. So for example, you could um, maybe describe the, the texture or the smooth texture of the car or the coarse texture of the ground. Um, you could describe different properties such as the illumination, the contrast of the car to the background and, and so on. But most importantly, uh, you would want to describe semantic properties or semantic attributes of the image. Uh, for example, the round wheels uh, or the roof of the cars and the handles and the relation between uh, the different uh, parts of the objects uh, and so on. So um, what I would like to argue in this talk is that if we want to uh, build uh, intelligent machines, uh, we want to be able to understand all of these properties and particularly the semantic ones. One way in which we can uh, sort of uh, do this is by uh, demonstrating that uh, the AI we built is able to manipulate or create these different properties um, in images and videos and so on. And so uh, there's a famous quote by uh, Richard Feynman, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So the ability to create, manipulate is tightly related to understanding. Okay, so people began looking at uh, ways of manipulating these uh, different properties. So for example, uh, in the context of uh, texture transfer, uh, these are some of the very early works from the uh, 2000s. Um, methods uh, such as uh, the one by Efros et al called um, image quilting uh, were proposed, whereby we stitch together small patches of an existing image uh, and were thus able to transfer uh, the texture of an image uh, to some content image. Um, sort of later works emerge and, and one of the, in, in the context, for example, of uh, style transfer, uh, where one is given a content image and we want to transfer, transfer the style of uh, some reference image. So um, earlier works were non-parametric, but you know, already in 2015, 14, um, new methods were uh, emerged, which are based on CNNs, and those produce much better results. So here is an example of a famous work by uh, Gatis et al, uh, where they proposed to model the content of a photo as feature responses from some pre-trained CNN, and further model the input style as uh, summary feature statistics. But in both of these examples, um, we don't have the ability to control the structure or semantic properties uh, in the image. So if we move beyond style and texture transfer, we want to also adapt structure or semantic properties. So here, for example, uh, we want to adapt the woman face by adding glasses from some source image. And um, this is more complicated because we don't only need to understand the structure of objects such as glasses and so on. We also want to understand how to adapt these uh, objects to target image, which could have a different pose, illumination and so on. Uh, here's another example where we want to generate an image which is analogous to a target, but where the structure of objects is taken from uh, the source image. So we have to understand in this case how ducks look like in order to transfer them uh, to the target image. And uh, finally, here's another uh, example where we want to generate an image. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, actually a, a different kind of example where we actually uh, want to uh, stylize a 3D object. So we want to be able to view this horse from uh, multiple direction, and we want to be able to uh, manipulate it using uh, some text prompt, some intuitive uh, text like a robot, a poncho, or major scales, and we wanted to be able to adapt, uh, adapt the input. Okay, so, um, Beyond just the scientific interest, which is uh, nice in itself of, you know, understanding by manipulating and controlling uh, the input, um, there's also a number of um, um, you know, applications uh, that 
the ability to manipulate or, or control the input uh, has. So just to give you a few uh, a flavor of this, for example, in architecture uh, design, um, let's say the designer designed a particular, um, you know, um, designed this this house or, or or some some other structure, and then we want to um, adapt this structure, manipulate it uh, in automatic way. Um, then we want to be able to manipulate the structure of the building, the trees, and so on. Uh, if we look at video games, we went we may want to adapt the scenes uh, and different objects in the scene, such as the bus, the car, and so on. Movies again. Um, more realistic sort of uh, effects and so on, and the ability to change uh, to change the scene. Uh, in advertising, so um, I'm sure maybe maybe you're familiar with these kinds of products or, or ideas, but the ability to place a sofa in a realistic way um, in, in your living room or, or uh, to man manipulate what you already see, uh, that could could be interesting in that dance, that sense. And also for uh, autonomous driving, if you uh, give agents um, more realistic um, or, or a range of realistic uh, environments by, by manipulating the, the structure of uh, um, existing environments, then uh, that, that could provide uh, a more interesting training data. Uh, and lastly, um, so for example, in, in, I think in the context of AR and VR, uh, this can be very useful as well. So um, you must have this. There's recently been um, a lot of interest in the in AR and uh, VR. Um, either companies like Facebook with the Metaverse, um, or or Google, and of course Microsoft as well. Um, so I think this this uh, the ability to take content and uh, semantically manipulate it is could be especially useful. Uh, in augmented reality applications. Okay, so now let's let's let me start with uh, the first part of the talk where I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, semantic manipulation of uh, images. So uh, the first set of approaches are ones which uh, takes as input uh, many images, many collection of images, uh, as as training for uh, as a supervision. So uh, the first set of approaches, these are fully supervised. So basically a training, we're given a pair of uh, segmentation map uh, and, and the corresponding uh, image. And, um, and, and these sort of describe the semantic entities uh, in, 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 the, in the image. And at test time, what we want to do is we want to control the structure of objects, um, for example, by giving us a different segmentation map uh, and generating an image that corresponds to that uh, segmentation. But the supervised setting is is very expensive. You you require uh, this this annotation of uh, these segmentation masks. Um, for, so um, we began looking at sort of unsupervised setting, and in the unsupervised setting, um, we have the input is basically two unpaired sets of images A and B. So in this example, A and B, um, so for example, they, sh they share the common content, which is uh, the facial features, but B contains an additional content in the form of uh, glasses. Our test time, we're interested in transferring the glasses that are unique to domain B onto images in domain A. So here uh, is an example of transferring the glasses uh, from the images on the left to the faces on the top row. And so you can see how we had uh, the glasses had to be adapted uh, according to, po to the pose and, and uh, of the source uh, image. We actually investigated uh, this setting in, in a number of works. Uh, the first work considered the setting that I just described. Um, in the second work, we extended this setting to the case where both groups contain a separate property such as a smile uh, or glasses. And the third work uh, improved the generation quality uh, by generating a mass and only locally changing the region of interest. Um, but all of these approaches require a large collection of images uh, from both domains. 
So actually, I want to uh, discuss uh, uh, um, an approach that really requires just two images uh, at training. And this uh, type of approach is called uh, a, a patch-based uh, approach. So traditionally, when we want to model the distribution of images, um, then we may train a model such as a GAN or a variational autoencoder. And what we do is we would collect a, a large group of images and then model their distribution. So here is an example from uh, now already old, I should say. There's, there's been like tremendous progress here. Um, StyleGAN, and I think now there's or, or much better, even better uh, guns out there. Um, but what, what I want to propose here instead is, and instead what we can do is we can take a single image and consider the distribution of patches of that image at different scales. So maybe we consider this patch, this patch, or this patch, or uh, smaller patches uh, in the image. So how can we use this um, to semantically manipulate an image? So, um, the first work I want to show in that regard is that of structural analogy. And a training, we're given uh, a pair of images, uh, like this, these two pair of images. And we're interested in producing images that are analogous to uh, the source, some source image, but depict the structure from uh, another image. Okay, so in this example, we, uh, we want to take, produce image which is analogous to the dog footprints but depicts the structure from the uh, snow steps image. So to illustrate this, uh, let's take this source image of balls and target image of marbles. What we want to do is we want to generate an image that follows the spatial distribution or the structure of the balls, and second, depicts the internal patch statistics of the marbles. So we can see that the generated marbles, they look realistic and the, they are of the correct shape, um, but follow the spatial distribution of the balls. And we can do this also in the reverse direction and in other examples. So here is the example I've shown earlier with the uh, ducks and orcas, or translating between uh, pumpkins and balloons, and so on and so forth. You may ask, well, is this similar to style transfer? Um, it is, but both, um, well, both of these, um, you know, both style transfer and deep image analogy uh, operate on a pair of images. Uh, unlike our method, they can, uh, neither of these methods can change the shape of objects. Uh, so notice, for example, how in style transfer, the shape of the building and the shape uh, of the face uh, remains intact. Okay, but in contrast, uh, a method can change the shape of objects while creating analogous solutions. So let's let's take this example, given an image A of snow steps, an image B of dog footprints. Uh, a method generates an image of snow steps that follows the same spatial distribution of dog footprints uh, while depicting object structure from the source snow steps image. And this is also true in the reverse direction. So, let me give you the, the intuition or the motivation to this. The key idea is to produce a mapping between the multi-scale patch distribution of A and that of B. So at core scale, uh, this means that the spatial alignment of the dog foots must resemble that of the snow steps. At a finer scale, uh, if we have a patch that contains two footprints next to each other, this must be mapped to uh, two snow steps beside each other. And at even a finer scale, uh, the upper part of the foot uh, step is mapped to a small snow step, and similarly the bottom part. While we produce these uh, mapping, we still have uh, you can see still see how the snow steps still remain human-like and not dog-like. Okay, so let's dive a bit deeper of how we realize this uh, this mapping. Um, basically, our approach contains of a uh, hierarchical structure. The hierarchy starts at the courses level zero, where we consider large patches in the image, 
and we move up to uh, up to level n, where we consider sm finer, smaller patches. And the hier hierarchy operates both in an unconditional and conditional setting. Okay, so we start. We begin by unconditionally generating random samples from the same patch distribution of A. In this case, the the, the pumpkin image. So um, at we begin with at the first level zero. We begin with some uh, random noise uh, Z zero as input. Uh, we have some generated GA that takes this noise and outputs this low resolution image of a pumpkin. And how do we assess that this image is real? Well, we have this uh, discriminator DA, and this is a patch discriminator, so it considers the image realistic if its patches are realistic. Um, also, GA is uh, fully convolutional and it has a fixed receptive field, so it only manipulates patches uh, in uh, of the output. Right. So after the level zero, when we move to a higher level of n, the generated GA gets as input the low resolution uh, image generated at a previous scale and some random noise, and outputs a higher uh, resolution image. So again, because GA is fully convolutional and has a fixed receptive field, so it only manipulates patches in the input low resolution image. And um, as, as in the previous scales, we use a patch, uh, patch discriminator, which considers the image realistic if the patches of the image are realistic. OK, so once we generate this pumpkin image in the unconditional um, uh, using the unconditional generation, uh, we move to the conditional part where um, we pass the pumpkin, the generated pumpkin image through a uh, bees generator GB to generate uh, an image of balls. And again, we use a patch discriminator DB to generate realistic uh, patches of balls. And uh, after that, we pass the uh, generated uh, image of ball back through uh, GA, the generator of uh, pumpkins. And we use a cycle loss between the generated image and the input uh, pumpkin image. So that, that ensures we have an alignment uh, between the two images. But more precisely, because GA and GB have a fixed receptive field, what this in fact results in is a matching between the patches of the image. So uh, we may have uh, a matching between this patch of a pumpkin and this patch of uh, uh, these two uh, balloons. And also at a smaller scale, we have uh, this, this matching. So this is the, the matching that I, I talked about uh, earlier. Um, OK, so there's many different tricks that we used, but just to mention one interesting one. Uh, in The image of pumpkin and it tries to add to this instead of just generating the uh, balloons image from scratch it tries to add the minimal amount of detail to the image of pumpkin so as to generate a realistic image of balloons and this prevents the network from uh, cheating creating non-analogous uh, solutions okay so let's see a little bit of uh, uh, the comparison so for example here um, you, you can see an example of um, oranges translated to uh, marbles, and you can see that they, 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 while we create a realistic image of marbles of, or oranges, um, the, also the, the, uh, the alignment is, is correct. And if we use style transfer or other uh, similar methods, then uh, either the image is unrealistic or produced blurry. Uh, Blair results. Some other interesting applications. Um, so, so, for example, uh, if we want to translate a rough black and white sketch uh, to a photorealistic image, um, so we can we can have this, for example, sketch of um, of birds and produce a realistic image of uh, of birds given just a single input image uh, of birds on on the left. And this similarly holds for the hot air balloons. So you only have as an input this one image of hot air balloons, 
a rough sketch of the whole turbulence and you can produce uh, this uh, realistic image that is aligned uh, with your sketch. And um, lastly, we, we try this, this idea um, on, on, a, on an input video. So we have this um, video, for example, of hot air balloons on the left, and we want to produce uh, an analogous video uh, given only just the single image uh, on the top, so the, the, the bird's image on the top. And um, we didn't use any temporal information. So um, on the, the only source of uh, movement is from the from the video on the left. So uh, that's why maybe um, you know the the birds while while they they pick the right movement, they, they, maybe that's not how uh, birds actually fly. But you can actually see that the birds look more or less realistic. Okay. <clears throat> so, right, so this is, um, so I talked a little bit about uh, semantic man uh, structure manipulation of images. And uh, before I move on to the second part, where I'm going to talk about manipulation of videos, um, if there are any questions, then uh, please let me know. Okay, cool. Um, so we talked about uh, manipulation of images. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about semantic manipulation of uh, videos, and I'm going to consider a different type of uh, manipulation. In particular, before we we uh, in, in this part in this particular manipulation, I want to reduce the amount of information uh, that we receive rather than add or change it. So uh, let's see what I mean. So um, when we watch a video, we can often easily tell the speediness of videos. That is whether the videos are slower than normal speed, whether they're played at normal speed, or whether they're played at faster than normal speed. And the reason we can do it is because we know how uh, objects such as people or cars, how they move in the world and their natural rate of motion. And so what we try to do in this work is to uh, ask an AI to automatically predict the speediness in videos. So um, in particular, if we understanding the speediness of objects in an unsupervised manner uh, requires a semantic understanding of objects. OK, um, so as I will show, also this understanding can help solve different tasks and in particular uh, manipulate uh, videos. Uh, so just just a side note um, in some sometimes the videos are not played well um, over the conference so all the videos that you'll see here are actually present in this uh, this link um, and, and also this this much more there. okay so in particular uh, we consider the task of taking an input video um, and uh, speeding it up so on the left side, we uh, speed up a video of athletes sprinting uh, uniformly at twice the original speed. And so the result is undes undesirable and natural jittery motion. And in contrast, um, a method can be used to adaptively uh, change the speed rate based on the video content. So here you can see the same video using a method based on speediness prediction. It has the same total duration as the previously uniformly sped up one, um, but it is much more natural looking. Um, again, you have to believe me that the one on the left is 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 very jittery and un unnatural. For some reason, it doesn't uh, quite uh, play uh, play well when over the uh, video conference. Okay. So, in addition to adaptively speed up speeding up videos. Uh, predicting the speediness gives rise to other applications such as uh, supervised action recognition as well as video retrieval. Okay, so how is this done? Well, we trade a network called SpeedNet to classify whether a given video is of uh, normal speed or whether it is sped up. And um, a training 
uh, we train our network on short videos of uh, 30 clips, and this is done in a self-supervised manner with no manual limitations. So for normal speed videos, we played videos at their normal speed rate, and for the sped up ones, we applied a uniformly sped up uh, speed up. Um, okay, so let's look a little bit more closely at our, our architecture. Um, we begin with the input frames, which may be of normal speed or sped up. Okay, uh, we then pass them through a 3D uh, based convolutional network, and this is similar to uh, S3DG network or uh, an action recognition kind of network, um, which produces these spatial temporal feature maps. We then apply uh, pooling. And in particular, uh, one thing to note here is that uh, we apply spatial um, um, max pooling and temporal average pooling. Okay. And uh, you can think of it that in, in the temporal domain, we want to average the speediness across multiple frames. So in some regions, there may be uh, no, uh, nothing happens. Maybe I don't move and some regions I move very fast. But on average, uh, the speediness over many frames would be, um, um, would be the normal speed rate of, of a person moving. Um, <clears throat> however, in, in the spatial domain, uh, if I have two objects that I move, I want to pick the the most the uh, the most speedy object in in the in the frame. So that's why I do spatial max pulling and temporal average pulling. And finally, we uh, after we do this pulling, we we, we generate our uh, prediction, which is a normal speed or sped up. Um, just one thing that that's important to note is that. Uh, in, when, when we train SpeedNet, one thing which is very important is to apply um, a wide range of augmentations. So for example, spatial augmentations, temporal augmentations, and what we call same batch training. So when we say sp spatial augmentation, that means we take the input frames and we simply uh, do some random resize, both down sample and up sample. And that means that the network cannot no longer rely on size dependent factors such as uh, uh, motion magnitude. Uh, when we talk about temporal augmentations, so for the normal speed rate videos, we actually produce videos which are about 1.2 x of the original uh, speed rate. And similarly for the sped up one, we, we, we make it between 1.7 to 2.2 x and we do so basically by randomly skipping uh, frames with some probability, and this this produces uh, this the desired um, uh, speed rate. So you can just an illustration, just remove some of the frames here. And lastly, what we found out is actually that using um, uh, same batch training, that means that um, we, we within the same batch we give both the normal speed video and the sped up video. Uh, to SpeedNet, and it has to classify um, either the, the video either as normal speed or sped up. Okay, um, so now what? So so once we train SpeedNet at at inference time, uh, given a video clip, we run our model in a sliding window fashion. So uh, like like this, and this produces. Um, the, the, this speed up curve where it tells us the regions which SpeedNet thinks are sped up and regions which are not. And so we do not expect to predict all the time specs uh, perfectly. So for example, uh, some regions may contain little to no motion. Um, but as long as the network thinks that certain parts of the uh, video are not sped up, what we can do is we can keep speeding up those video segments even further and this is what gives rise to our uh, adaptive speed up, uh, speed up. Okay, I will actually skip this part, but um, yeah, I will, I will skip this part. I think this talks about how we produce the speediness curves. Um, but once, but 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 intuitively, the idea is that um, wh whenever we have a region that SpeedNet thinks is not sped up, we basically can speed it up more and more and more until SpeedNet tells us, okay, this region is now uh, sped up. So 
we can now see, uh, we can now use these. Um, uh, so here, here, here are a few examples. Uh, so here you can see uh, a video of people uh, jumping onto a pool that was uniformly sped up uh, by 2x. So its total duration is half the original uh, duration. And on the right, we use the adaptive speed up. So each segment of the video was sped up as long as speed had determined the segment uh, to be of normal speed. So in particular, the result is of the same duration, uh, but is much more natural and less jittery. And here is another example uh, of a dancer that uh, on the left was uniformly sped up with 2x. And on the right, we, we see the same result using our adaptive speed up instead. And we did this for many videos, and you, you can see all of them in the, um, in the link that I shared. And uh, there was a clear advantage in a, in a user study that we did over that for the adaptive speed up. Okay, we can also use speed up in other, uh, in other self-supervised tests. So recall that we, we didn't use any annotations in our training. So we, we trained speed up on a large corpus of videos of kinetics in a self-supervised manner. Uh, and then what we can do, we can utilize the space-time representations that SpeedNet learned and fine-tune our model for uh, action recognitions. So um, at the time of pub publishing the paper, uh, our method be uh, beats all uh, other models that were pre-trained in self-supervised manner on kinetics. But this, this, I should say that the, the speed of at which papers are uh, produced is so fast that I'm uh, I'm pretty sure nowadays this is uh, probably outdated. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so you guys, you, you have compared SpeedNet uh, to prior art on mm -hmm. which task? On action recognition, given uh, compressed, uh, like a shortened video or uh, uh, yeah, twice so what, the, what the speed? In other cases, no. So, so um, what you do in 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 uh, standard so uh, in self supervised action recognition, the way the way you do the evaluation is that you first train in a um, the, the, you do self supervised uh, learning on kinetics. So in this case, we we just took took a speednet, trained it to predict on this uh, sped up or not sped up. Uh, on this data set of kinetics. And then we, 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 we took this network and we fine-tuned it in a supervised manner on UCF, either on UCF 101 or HMDB 51. And these two data sets are much, much smaller. So this is a kind of, um, you are saying I'm, I'm going to train in supervised manner in a very, very small, uh, very, very little data, and this way I know that um, this pre-training uh, on kinetic uh, helps in some sense. It makes sense. Yep. And um, what? So action recognition usually is around ten seconds video, right? Um, yeah, it depends on the data set, but yes, I guess so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was the window size of the model? We use uh, thirty-two frames, and I think it was twenty-four frames per second videos. Uh, so maybe we would average uh, the prediction made. So so we, we basically pass it in a sliding window fashion with overlapping, and then we we, we take the prediction. I see. Uh, and uh, so you run it in a sliding window. So each window has this uh, feature vector of uh, the, the the pooling layer, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and then how uh, you you aggregate the result to the classification for the so we have uh, yeah we we take it with some overlapping so you take 32 frames 32 frames right and then you do some overlapping and then you produce the softmax scores uh, for all of these overlapping uh, regions and you take uh, you just do maximum so the the one which is uh, I see uh, and that would correspond to the, the, the to the point in the video where the, the object uh, moves uh, fastest, right? And that would indicate. Uh, yeah, because we did the, the we did the pooling on we did average in time, and 
max in uh, in space. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Cool. So uh, yeah. So we used it also for self-resection recognition, but we also use it for video retrieval. So uh, we extract uh, the speednet embeddings, but this time we took it after uh, the pulling. So for a given query clip. Uh, we find the nearest neighbors in embedding space uh, either within the same video or for a query clip across videos. Um, and one thing to note is because Vidnet was not trained specifically for action recognition, uh, what we see in this example is that some of the neighbors are not necessarily of the same class, but contain similar motion patterns. So for example, when we have this person free falling uh, in the sky, it has a similar motion pattern to a person surfing, at least from the point of view of uh, speaking. And uh, one thing, the, the last thing I want to show is uh, here's a here's an artistic YouTube video that was made by uh, some artists called uh, Bill Newsinger, and it was combined by st stitching together spatial temporal regions taken at normal speed and some other region taken at slow motion. And we can use speednet to detect speediness not only in time, but both in space and time. Um, so what we can see here is a visualization of speednet predictions using uh, class activation maps. So in blue or green, uh, these are regions which are of normal speed, and in yellow or orange uh, are slow down regions. And uh, you can see how speednet detects spatial temporal regions of slow motion and, and normal speed. OK, so um, just to recap, uh, part one, we talked about um, particularly about one method, but about uh, generally about semantic manipulation uh, of images. The second part, I talked about a different type of manipulation where we actually want to take a video and make it shorter, but do so in a semantic way. And uh, in the last part of the talk, I want to talk about uh, semantic manipulation of 3D objects. Um, so before I do that, if there are any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. <clears throat> right. OK, so um, this is actually um, a work by from CVPR, the very recent CVPR, so now uh, it will be shown in, uh, in in June, and it's called Text to Mesh, uh, Text-Driven Stylization for, for Meshes. Um, so I th there's two different examples, um, different um, aspects to this work from the ones I've shown before, and one is obviously that we want to manipulate or change a 3D object, so we want to have the, the ability to view the object, like the horse, for multiple views, but also uh, the way in which we change the object is different. So in this case, uh, we are given some text prompt. So this could think of it as uh, just uh, s sitting in, 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 in front of, uh, um, you know, anybody can give um, a, a text prompt and uh, be an artist this way by just specify, I want this horse to look like a robot or a poncho and so on. So both the type of the, the way in which we manipulate the object uh, and uh, the type of object is, is different in this case. So just to show a few examples, uh, the our 3D manipulation should be uh, aware of the global semantics. So in this example here, uh, you can see how we um, stylize uh, an example of Iron Man, uh, and you can see how the, we are aware of all the um, we consider both muscles, clothing, material, and different textures. Uh, here's another example. Um, the network needs, need, you can see that there is a global understanding of the fact that light also exists within the uh, within this uh, brick lamp, but it also correctly uh, finds the texture of the brick. Um, here's another example of a colorful crochet candle and uh, an as astronaut host. And that's a nice example here is that, you know, um, our, our network never saw an example of an astronaut uh, horse, and it was able to imagine how such an astronaut uh, horse would look like. And all of these examples are actually um, 
you know, this, this, these are three D examples. So um, if if you go to the to the website, you'll be able to see them uh, from from different views uh, as well. So let's begin with an overview of our method. We, uh, as input, we have a mesh and a target uh, text prompt. Uh, in this example, um, example of a donut and the text prompt is donut with sprinkles. Um, and we start with the input mesh, which we pass through a network which we call the neural style field. Um, now this is uh, a, an implicit network. So what it, this means, it takes as input a vertex coordinate on the mesh. Uh, we, we pass it through something called a positional encoding. And then it passes, uh, after we pass it through a positional encoding, we pass it through two uh, multi-layer perceptions which produce uh, two things. One is the color for that vertex on the mesh. And uh, second is a, a possible geometric change, which is basically a displacement along the normal uh, of that uh, 3D point along the mesh. And so the displacement is used to create a geometric change and the color is used to create this uh, texture change. And by doing this, for all the vertices of the mesh, we are producing this uh, stylized uh, mesh example. So uh, after we produce this stylized uh, mesh, we pass it through a differential renderer. And what this differential renderer does is enable us to produce multiple views of the, of the input mesh. And we also produce, um, in addition, we produce a number of 2D augmentations. So for example, we might uh, create local crops or uh, change the perspective uh, in an image. And the last step is how we derive is, is actually the component that derives the uh, stylization. And uh, we basically take all these 2D augmented uh, views of the image and uh, we pass it through um, 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 a semantic loss basically uh, called um, a, a multimodal semantic uh, embedding space of uh, CLIP. If, if you're familiar with CLIP, is basically uh, a way of semantically comparing uh, a text and an image. So uh, what we want to do is that under the semantic loss, all of these 2D augmented views should be semantically similar to the input uh, text prompt of Donut with, with sprinkles. Okay. So um, I'd like to cons let, let's look at this component in, in a little bit more detail. Um, so the, the positional encoding is a frequency-based uh, encoding, and that was introduced in, uh, if you're familiar with the, the NERF paper. Um, so th th they actually introduced it uh, there. And uh, it, it's basically a frequency-based uh, encoding of the input and actually this frequency-based encoding allows us to control the frequency of the output. So you can see uh, that uh, uh, in these, these the different examples where we, um, uh, when we change the uh, standard deviation uh, in, in the frequency-based encoding, we can control the output frequency. Um, so the next, uh, the next component is actually those two MLPs that produce either a color or displacement along the normals. And so here you can see an example of uh, alien made of bark. Uh, and you can see that when we produce both, uh, when we predict both color and displacement, then the result looks most realistic. And actually when we just produce we actually train only train the color or only train the geometry component, then um, the results look less realistic. And in fact, what what happens when we produce just the color component is that the network tries to hallucinate some uh, geometric details. So the next component, as I said, is uh, producing these. Uh, we render the the three D object for multiple views, and um, yeah, I'll actually skip this part, but it's important to to um, to uh, the views um, should be uh, selected in such a way that they capture most of the objects. I don't want to, for example, for this camel, uh, I don't want to pick it in such a way that it's underneath the camel, but actually this is most of the most of the semantic entities uh, of the camel.
Um, augmentations actually are very important. We produce both. Uh, we actually do both global augmentations of a random perspective augmentation and local augmentations. And um, some probably should uh, finish soon, so I'll, I'll move a little bit quicker on this. Uh, but um, here are the different. Um, yeah, so here you can see the different. But basically, if if um, using all of these components that I mentioned, so the position on coding, uh, the implicit networks, and the augmentations are actually very important. And you can see here that without these uh, components, we uh, either produce, um, you know, either no fine detail is produced or uh, unnatural stylization and so on. So actually, all of these components are very important. Um, and as I mentioned, the last component is the clip uh, based component that allows us to put to to semantically compare uh, the text prompt with all those uh, uh, renderings. Um, what is clip? Just just to say two words, uh, what clip does is takes a, a text prompt, encodes it, uh, and then uh, takes an image. And the, the way it was trained is that so as to produce high cost and similarity uh, in the embedding space between images and text which actually match and reduce the similarity for non-matching pairs. So what we do is, as I said, we embed all the augmented views uh, to get um, an average, a, an average those views in the embedding space of clip to get some representation S. We embed the text prompt to get a representation T. And then what we want to do is we maximize the cosine similarity between S and T. And this what is what drives our um, uh, the gradient flow onto the uh, our implicit uh, style network. So just to mention a few important advantages, we did not use any 3D data set or uh, a GAN. We only used a clip, so this method is uh, zero shot in that sense that we didn't need to use a data set for, for training. Um, we actually can produce arbitrarily high resolutions because we have this implicit network representation. We can sample coordinates uh, along the grid as fine as we wish. Um, and triangulation of the mesh can be done arbitrarily dense. Um, interesting observation here is that we have this disentanglement into an explicit explicit mesh con uh, content, uh, which which is, is given as an input, and implicit uh, neural style field. Um, and because the network was trained in a zero shot way. We can the network was, works very well on uh, in the wild meshes with arbitrary styles and also out of domain uh, stylization. So here you can see examples for um, this 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 shoe uh, that we we can produce different uh, stylizations. Um, here's an example of the uh, crochet and and again the the robot. Um, I find this this very cool. In fact, that we can also produce uh, stylization of humans, but not only that, Clip has some understanding of um, actually individual humans. Apparently, uh, you know, maybe Steve Jobs um, actually appeared a lot in the text from that it was trained. So you can see that it produced this um, stylization of uh, text uh, of Steve Jobs, uh, which probably might look familiar um, and also messy. So you can see how he, it, it actually produced the actual writing of the name Lionel on the uh, shirt of, uh, of of the human object here. Um, one thing that is interesting is that we can increase the granularity of text. So we can start with this uh, lamp that just says uh, I want this to look like a lamp. I can produce add more detail, like a Luxo lamp, a blue steel Luxo lamp, and so on. I can also increase the mesh granularity. And uh, interestingly, because a clip can also accept as input uh, not only a text but also an image, I can also use an image to stylize the input mesh, like the the pig here, uh, and even stylize it using uh, a target mesh. Um. 
just as an, uh, an, an aside, side note, um, Clip is actually very, um, you know, uh, very useful for um, any uh, different types of stylization. So in, in this different work, we actually used it for um, uh, image based uh, style transfer. Uh, we call it essence transfer, uh, but it's, it's actually very useful uh, not only for 3D, but uh, other visual content as well. OK, so uh, to summarize, um, what I try to illustrate in this talk is that um, the takeaway message, if you like, is that one way to achieve a visual understanding of the world around us is by uh, semantic manipulation. Um, so um, we talked about semantic manipulation of images, which I, 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 we, we either have a multi-sample approach that use many images as input uh, for training, uh, but I also I concentrated on uh, the example of structural analogies um, via uh, the patches of image pair. We can look at videos uh, where uh, we want to have a, a different type of manipulation where we want to speed up videos uh, gracefully using speed as uh, supervision. And we talked about 3D objects. So, um, and, and in, in, in this case, um, you know, the, the way in which uh, we want to manipulate the object is actually via text, via some uh, semantic, uh, easily, uh, e easy sort of, um, Let's, let's say interpretable prompt uh, that the user can give in order to manipulate uh, the world around us. And so when we look at uh, what's next, in, in general, I think, uh, you know, uh, manipulating the world uh, around us can be very useful for a variety of uh, different contexts, but particularly sort of the more immediate challenges, um, maybe manipulating uh, 3D objects within more complex scenes. So, for example, uh, having uh, if, if you take a look at your living room and you want to just change certain objects there, um, manipulating uh, under constraints some uh, AR devices such as optical see-through, we are actually constrained. But how we can uh, change the, 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 the what we see? We may, for example, in optical see-through, we can only add light. Uh, onto the scene. And actually what I call functional relationships is when we want to uh, manipulate the relationship between objects in the scene. So for example, uh, let, let's say I have a person riding a bike and I want to change it so that now is a person uh, that is walking beside the bike. Um, so th these are sort of the immediate challenges, but in general, I think this is an interesting framework for uh, visual understanding. So. That is it, and uh, I'm happy to take questions.